everyone knows and should be a member of their SST committees, right? Their student support teams. Um, students have to go through response to intervention. They have to have strategies put in place to, um, before they uh, become, the, um, before they're evaluated for special education. You have to give them a decent chance, okay? When you're on the SST uh, team, your uh, uh, tier one, your responsibility is to make sure the student can hear and the student can see. If they can't, you refer them. They get whatever um, you know, accommodations they need, glasses, they get their ears, um, their um, ear infection treated or whatever, okay? So you guys are doing that. You should know the health history and the current health status of the student, right? So you're gonna call the mom, talk to the mom or family member, guardian, and, um, and uh, get the current uh, status on that. You are going to assess the child, okay? You're gonna do your health appraisal, and you're gonna go in the classroom, please go in the classroom, <laughs> and observe the student, okay? So um, it's oftentimes that um, a student will look terrible on paper, and then you go in the classroom and they're running around, they look, you know, couldn't pick them out from the rest of their typical peers. Or they look perfectly normal on paper, and then you go in the classroom and you think, was anybody gonna ever tell me that the student didn't have hands, you know, right? So, um, you know, you really need to go in and observe the student, not only in a classroom, but you know, in different, different settings. This is true for all kids. So we all know the story of the kid with uh, ADHD, right? Goes to the doctor's office, small little quiet, comfy, warm doctor's office, two adults there, it's very safe and secure. He looks totally fine, he comes back without a you know, diagnosis of ADHD. You go in the classroom and he's a molecule, the bouncing around looks like you know, ping pong ball, right? So you have to, we have to observe, and we have to refer and follow up. <laughs> Tier two, uh, this is where if the regular interventions and supports don't uh, help the student, then they have to give um, extra evidence-based interventions um, uh, from uh, teaching. And then tier three is when we're really referring the kid, psych services, youth and family, um, uh, maybe they need section 504, uh, and then if they may need to be referred on for evaluation for special ed. The special education process, student can be identified by a child sign team, they can be identified by a state agency, parent can come in with their concerns, the teachers can bring them in through SST, or basically anybody who has a concern can bring the child up, okay? If it looks like the student needs to go beyond response to intervention, okay, then the SST committee um, meets and then they have to uh, consent, the parent has to consent to an evaluation. And at that point, your student support team um, kind of turns in then to your our committee, okay? And so I'm gonna turn it over to Karen and she's gonna talk about her particular expertise is the um, a full and individual evaluation process. Thank you, let me take a minute just to say thank you for letting me come and address you today and entertain any questions that you have in a few minutes because I know you're such an integral part of our evaluations and we probably, um, you probably know us with a little piece of paper in our hand saying, I have to have this today, oh I meant yesterday. And so uh, we appreciate all that, that patience and all the, the help that you've given us and continue to give us every day. At the SST, uh, those children who have obvious disabilities, we're considering that they have an intellectual disability or uh, previously called mental retardation, or that we suspect that they have autism or they have a physical anomaly, um, orthopedic impairment or, or spina bifida or something like that, those children can be immediately referred through your SST process, and you play a very integral part in getting the SST to recognize that. We still continue to do educational accommodations. We continue to do uh, some type of strategy to help that child learn, but um, I've had people tell me, well, I have to do 12 weeks of intervention, and that's not true with some of those more severe cases, so you might want to just uh, remember that as you're interacting with your SST, is that, we do do interventions, we do do accommodations. However, if that child has a pretty severe, obvious need, then we wanna go ahead and get that evaluation started. So whenever the parent gives consent, 
we have 60 days from the date of the receipt of the consent to complete an evaluation. Parent doesn't have to give us consent, uh, and if they don't, the district has a decision to make as to whether or not we're gonna go to due process and force an evaluation or whether we're not. It's usually very, very rare that we would do that, but we would continue with our accommodations. So once the parent gives us consent and we do the evaluation, either a diagnostician or a psychologist, a licensed specialist in school psychology, or a speech therapist, if it's only for speech services, would actually be the evaluation case manager. And a short word for that is you hear people say, testing, I'm gonna do the testing. So um, they're gonna be looking for a disability and they're gonna be looking for a way to inform instruction. And it's very possible a child has a disabling condition but doesn't have a need for special education and therefore the informing instruction becomes very important. Instructional services are things such as speech, or adaptive PE, or assistive technology. Now adaptive PE or um, adapt, uh, I'm sorry, it should be adapted PE, or assistive technology comes in after the child has a disability. Uh, however, speech services in the state of Texas can be a standalone disability of speech impairment. Related services, OTPT, orientation and mobility, nursing health services, uh, those type of services are related and they are there to support the instructional environment uh, for a child who could not access the general curriculum or could not benefit from special education without those additional services. So once the FIE is finished, then we go to a meeting called an R dismissal and re, um, R admission review and dismissal uh, committee meeting and where we, that's okay, uh, where we have to make a decision. A lot of states you'll hear it called IEP, Individual Education Program Meeting. But in Texas, we have our own language, as you know, so we call it an ARD meeting. And there are required members at the ARD meeting. And I'm, how many of you have never been to an ARD meeting? Okay. All right, the people who are required are the ones at the top of this list. And after that, other people are required as needed. If we're gonna be talking about a child who's gonna need health services, we certainly need a nurse present. If the child has a health impairment of some sort, we need a nurse present. If the child is going to be um, getting uh, vision services, we're gonna need that orientation and mobility person, perhaps, or the vision representative. And then campus personnel could be the counselor, the social worker. CTE is career and technology education representative. So if we're gonna be considering or providing services that are of a career and technology course nature, then we're gonna need a CTE representative. And then of course in the high school, we have the transition staff. So the people who are doing the individual evaluations for the students are the professionals on the campus. What oftentimes is overlooked or missed uh, for whatever reason, and we want to improve this process, is that the nurse, as a professional, should contribute to that evaluation. And that's where your health history and status is really important, okay? So at this point, you need to make sure that you've interviewed the parent, that you've collected the proper information from the teaching staff, that you have reviewed the records, right, medical records that have come in or whatever referral information has come back and that you go in and you do the classroom observation, okay? That health history and status you can do as a narrative, okay? And you can give it to your case manager, the person who's doing the evaluation, and they can attach it to the uh, FIE, part of the art document, as a professional report, okay? And that's very, very important because if a student is gonna get health services, we need to make sure that the assessment for those services is, is, is attached to the ARD, okay? Let's see what the next slide is. Okay. When you go in and you watch, look at the child in the um, classroom observation is when you would go in and, and look at the child in the classroom, you know, or on the playground or whatever, okay? Um, if the ch student has a significant health concern, you're gonna do your individual health care plan, okay? If the child needs an emergency care plan, 
The NETS should be part of the, of the um, evaluation, okay? That this student has significant needs as reflected in these two documents. And um, there is a way, you can either give it to um, your case manager in electronic uh, format, uh, email it to them, and, um, or you can take a hard copy with you to the ARD and they'll, they will attach it to the red folder, okay? Um, the uh, program that the evaluators are entering all this information for the student is the, called the EXCEED program. And nurses do not have access to enter information into the EXCEED. So we are dependent upon the kindness of your case manager, your evaluator, to help you with that, okay? Um, to make sure that you, the information is correctly entered, okay, before the art, okay? And we're gonna talk more about this. So uh, Karen and I discussed that the best way, I think, to make some of these points clear is to actually go through the ARD sequence and the documents and look at what those pages, um, what those screens look like where you would be expected to contribute information. Okay, and we hope that that's, that's helpful. So we're gonna look at the um, present levels of academic uh, achievement and functional performance. It's another uh, correction I need to make. The schedule of services, we're gonna talk more about the individual health plan and we're gonna talk about the committee minutes. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen. Okay, before we get to this part, back in the FID, for related service, every related service has to have an assessment. So if I'm going to need occupational therapy, the occupational therapist has done an assessment and written in the FIE. For school health services, as we've documented that child's needs, we've documented what am I getting in the way of his learning. And so part of that will become a related service assessment piece and the diagnostician or the psychologist that's the evaluation case manager uh, may be coming to you and saying, how would, should we write this? How would you word this? Or maybe they'll write something and then you need to, you need to probably uh, be part of that review before that event is locked. Because when you get to the ARD, when we get to this part, the foundation of everything we do in special education is that FIE, that full and individual evaluation. So that's the foundation. The art is the programming, and that's, where, that's the decision, the document, the agreement, the contract with the parent and the student of the services we're going to deliver. Most arts follow the same pattern. A good, well-run art is chaired by your uh, campus administrator, your district representative, and you have an agenda, and there should be an agenda on the table for the parents to see. We have agendas in English and in Spanish, and sometimes those agendas are adjusted depending upon how complex the art is. But the basic components are those that are on the screen. Um, it's good to introduce yourselves, everybody who knows what role they play. And procedural safeguards should have been provided prior to the art, but they could be provided in the beginning of the art. And then we usually talk about the evaluation and what other data we brought to the table today. So everybody has something they brought to the table, and based on that, a decision is made, does that child have a disability? If he has a disability, does he need special education? And then we have to make a decision, does the art committee agree that he should receive special education? And by that time, you're about to the end of, I think about page two in the art. And you're starting the big piece. And this is the foundation for the art, present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. And that drives the programming, and there's a set special section in the PLOF where the nurses can address and other people can address the gross motor, fine motor, and health needs of that child. From the PLOF, we, the art committee should say, based on these strengths and weaknesses that we talked about today and the impact of his disability, what goals and objectives do we need to develop in order to make a program for him? What accommodations and what modifications in the state student expectations and the TEKS do we need to make in order to give him access to general curriculum? And then from that, we say, based on these goals and objectives, what kind of services should he have? And that sends us then to the services page. The services page has your instructional accommodations, your instructional uh, classes. I need uh, assistance in English. 
and I need assistance in PE. I'm going to get uh, nursing services as a related service, and perhaps I'm going to get, uh, uh, maybe I'm going to get deaf ed interpreting as a related service. And then you talk about what other services do we need to help him, and that's called supplementary aids and services. Maybe assistive technology devices, or um, parent training, or in-home training. And then we talk about the setting, and the setting is going to be general ed perhaps, it could be a centralized unit. And then we finally wrap that up, a little feedback, we finally wrap that up with committee minutes and signatures. These are the disabilities. Multiple disabilities at the bottom is an indicator disability that states that the student has a two or more disabilities that are expected to be, in a, just in layman's terms, lifelong, that can be served by just one of those disabilities. You're going to be mostly involved, as you know, with the, your health impaired, traumatic brain injury, and then of course your vision and your hearing children. Uh, orthopedic, we seem to have fewer, uh, or I've seen fewer orthopedic impairment children today than I saw several years ago. You could be involved with all of these children because all of them could have some type of uh, medicine or some kind of seizure disorder or some other um, secondary need based on just because I'm uh, learning disabled doesn't mean that I don't have a need to get medicine or some, need something else. Karen, can I make a comment about uh -huh. this last slide, please? Uh, a very important thing, and it's often confusing for nurses, that like I'll get a call and I'll say, how, how do I get an OHI for a student? Or um, uh, something like that. What, what does it mean if uh, the student has TBI? What do they get? The eligibility is just a qualifying label for special education services. The eligibility does not determine the services that the child receives. The child's present level of academic achievement and functional performance, the goals and objectives, those determine what services. So where is the student now? And where do we want them to be? What are our expectations for a progress? So you could have any number of students with the same eligibility that have completely different services. So you could have OHI being ADHD, and the child just gets some you know, support with uh, their um, you know, English and math, but is in a regular classroom all day. Or you could have another health impairment of Hunter syndrome, and you might be in a PPCD and then an FLS or an ADL classroom and need direct skilled nursing services all day. So you can also have students with very different eligibility criteria who get relatively the same services. So under intellectual disabilities, you might have a student with Down syndrome who needs certain uh, uh, modification to their curriculum. And then you could have a child with traumatic brain injury that has a parallel or, you know, like cognitive functioning who would get similar services. Does that make sense? So there is no such thing as an OHI or, you know, these different disabilities. It's a label. Sometimes students have more than one label. They might be OHI, hearing impaired, or orthopedic and uh, something else, but it's not the eligibility that determines the services, it's the individual child's needs. Thanks. I think where you're mostly getting the uh, request for an OHI statement is once we get comfortable with the language, we, we turn it into shorthand or shortcuts. And instead of saying, I'm attempting to establish a disability for this child as other health impaired, with a condition of attention deficit disorder. And in order to do that, I need a doctor's involvement and I need doctor's documentation. So we change all of that to just, can you get me an OHI statement? So that's probably where you're picking up on that language is that our diagnosticians and psychologists are probably shortcutting the language. And here's where you get that form. If I'm an evaluator and I'm preparing an FIE, in my documents, there is a form for physician documentation and diagnosis. We identify the doctor diagnosis. 
So if we are at that stage, we may need to present that to the doctor. But in all reality, the doctor can put that on a paper sack or a piece of Word document or whatever, as long as we have the required information. So when they go to Youth and Family, Youth and Family is associated with our district, but Youth and Family doesn't necessarily use our forms unless we provide that form. They might send back and say, I've seen Johnny Brown. Johnny Brown's date of birth is, and he has a diagnosis of attention deficit um, hyperactivity disorder combined type, and the implications are, and it's suggested that he have this, and he's taking blah, blah medicine. We have our documentation from that doctor. We can then fill out the form that we have in our FIE. But it could be the parent has said all that. The psychiatrist over in Youth and Family said, my child had ADHD and we've started medication. If that's the case, as an evaluator, I'm going to print a form and I'm going to give it to the, hopefully, the nurse and ask the nurse to interact with that psychiatrist at Youth and Family and get it filled out. Now, why am I going to the nurse? I'm going to the nurse because hopefully you've got additional information or additional knowledge that you can gather other health information from that parent. Sometimes we give it to the parent and we say, take this to the doctor. It's really not the best way. Sometimes we fax it to the doctor ourselves. And that's okay too. But in a very best case scenario, that multidisciplinary team that's creating that full and individual evaluation includes a nurse who takes care of the medical end of uh, getting input from medical physicians and other practitioners. So that's probably where you're hearing, um, I need an OHI form. And then some of you may be saying to Robin, how do I get my OHI form? And so um, hopefully if that's been a question for you, we put that to rest. But if not, well, by all means, let me know. In your ARD paperwork, you're now at the ARD meeting. In the ARD paperwork, there's a determination of eligibility for special ed. And at the bottom, whenever we say he does have a disability, there's sections on that ARD form that list his disabilities. We're required to send up to three disabilities to PEMS, to the state of Texas, for PEMS reporting. However, many children who are medically involved or substantially involved may have a fourth or a fifth disability. So we can show those on the paperwork, but the first three, the primary condition, the secondary, and the tertiary, will be the ones reported to PEMS. And so that's why they're set up this way. And the evaluation should um, pretty well establish that. And then once that's decided at the first ARD, then that's the way it should stay until there's another evaluation. The um, present levels of academic achievement and functional performance that we talked about a while ago um, has the health section. And if it's an initial evaluation or it's a reevaluation, we ask that you coordinate or that our evaluator coordinate with you on, the, on those. If it's just an annual review, the uh, eval was last year, it's now 12 months later and we have to do an annual review, you're going to be collaborating with the teacher the campus teacher, his case manager uh, at, the, at the local campus, whoever's handling his services. And then your individual health plans are discussed in the ARD. They help drive the amount of services if needed as a related service. And as documentation for the decisions made in that ARD, that's when it's attached to the back of the ARD. Now I realize that doctor's orders change, IHPs change, but for that particular day, that's the document paper that said why we put 30 minutes of health services every day in the arm. And this is what the health section looks like on the plot. In the new EXCEED program, in the old Encore program that you may have seen, the forms, the blocks were uh, standard. They, weren't, they did not expand. However, in EXCEED, the areas in which you will be writing uh, will, it, will expand. So if the OT needs to say something, and the PT needs to say something, and the adapted PE person needs to say something, and the nurse needs to say something, all of those spaces across there will expand in order to let everybody put in what they need to say. Up at the top, uh, the third box on the left-hand side, um, it says medication for, and there's a drop down there. And if there's not a condition that needs to be in the R for your planning, you can let SDMS, uh, formerly called Encore, know, and they can add it in a matter of a few minutes. And therefore, you can have all of your um, you know, appropriate reasons. 
If for some reason you need more than what will fit in that blank, then you have an other box that can be can be filled in right under that. Goals and objectives for the uh, related service uh, will be sometimes embedded into instructional goals, but your individual health plan will always have your goals and objectives. If you need to send it to somebody to help you prepare for that ARD, be prepared for the ARD, you can send it electronically to your diagnostician, LSP, or the student's teacher, case manager, and then the hard copy is what's attached. For the goals and objectives um, section, and I've, I've learned so much from working on this with Karen, and, and every time you do one, you, you know, and go to an art and work on a new, um, uh, uh, prepare for uh, a new art meeting for a student, I mean, you're always going to learn something that's always different. There's so many steps in it. What I learned from Karen uh, in, prep in preparation for this talk is that the goals and objectives, when you put those in specifically, um, the teachers, uh, that's how they report the progress of the student according to their, uh, um, uh, let me say this, the goals and objectives are reported back to the student's progress according to those goals and um, objectives are reported at regular intervals to the parents, okay? So we are prepared as nurses right now to put standalone goals and objectives into the, um, our document because we don't have a system by which we are going to be reporting back to each one of these families every six weeks about how the student is uh, making measurable progress to those goals. And so what we're going to do instead is we're going to attach our IHP. And when you think about your IHP and the nursing process, they have all those same um, components as the goals and objectives and the present levels of performance. So this is where the student is, these are the outcomes that we're identifying, and this is what we're going to do to make sure that those students, you know, works towards those goals, and then we're always going to go back and evaluate. Okay. So your IHP has assessment data uh, that you collected on your student. It's got your nursing diagnosis, you know, um, it has goals and objectives, your goals, your interventions, and your evaluations where the IAP has kind of parallel things, and some of these you're going to contribute to, but the goals and objectives specifically are going to be covered by your goals in your IHP, okay? Because it would be terribly difficult for us to measure some of our individual health plan goals and we have a reporting system back to the parents about that. And so you probably appreciate that. So just, um, and by the way, I should have said at the beginning that we are going to um, uh, electronically send everybody a copy of the PowerPoint. So we uh, recognize that you're not going to be able to read all these slides, but you'll have a copy that you can save um, to your um, computer or print out from uh, your campus. Okay. So here again, you have your assessment data. Okay, that's your present level of, of performance. Your nursing diagnosis is basically what you're saying. This is why the student needs the health services that we're going to give. You have your goals. You have your interventions. This is exactly what we want uh, to do for the student. And then we have our outcomes. Okay? Those are your objectives. So they're very, very parallel. And this is why it's important to have an IHP prepared for um, the, uh, our document. Good language for both your IHPs and for the information that you want to contribute to the ARD should be student-centered, okay? So just like we're always going to put the student first in the way we talk with families and um, our educational staff, it's a student with diabetes, a student with autism, a student with asthma, not an asthmatic student or a, a autistic student. You want to put the student first, okay? Because this is the student's educational, individual educational plan. It's not your plan, it's the student's plan. So you want to put the student first. So it just if you start your sentences with students, I think you'll be golden with that. So things like student will experience minimal loss of instructional time due to whatever you're going to do for them. It's going to come to the um, clinic to do blood sugar checks before lunch. Student will experience increased time on tests due to adherence to 
medication regime for ADHD. Something like that. Student will in, experience increased participation in the educational program, secondary to proper self-management of asthma, okay, diabetes, whatever it is. So putting the student first, then, is an appropriate way to contribute the language to, to the IEP, okay? It's also good language for, um, for your individual health plan, okay? Um, when you're contributing language to the IEP, you always want to think about that mission and purpose. How is what I'm going to do to him reduce those barriers to learning so he can participate optimally in the educational plan, okay? So even though we're health professionals, we live in that educational world, and so we have to make sure that we use that language. So, um, you know, use things like minimizing loss of instructional time, increasing participation, optimizing, you know, attendance, or something like that, okay? Okay. Okay, in the R, there's a page that talks about the schedule of services. At the top of that page, it's going to talk about his instructional time. He's getting 45 minutes a day in English language arts, for example. In the middle of that page, there's a section for related services. And that's where you're going to be talking about an estimated number of minutes in order to serve the child for nursing services. And at the very bottom of the page, there's a section for supplementary services. And this is what the schedule page looks like in the Exceed program. You'll notice at the top it's special education instructional area support. And as you read across the page, uh, it says what's the start date and what's the end date. Traditionally, an annual ARD lasts for one year. If you're revising that ARD in the middle of the year, then that particular page may only be good for three more months or six months. Are the state uh, student expectations being modified? If they are, then that box is checked. And then the time, the frequency, duration, and so forth, location is listed next. And then whether, who's going to give that grade? Is it going to be a G for general ed teacher, or is it, a, is it going to be an S for special ed teacher? The related services, which is what you'll see, there's a drop down under related services, and school health services is listed. Uh, school health services is listed as opposed to nursing services because some of those services can be delegated. Again, you have another start and end date, and then you have the duration. In this example, this child would be getting 30 minutes a day, and the location of service is going to be in a public school setting, and the very far or location, and the very far right column uh, it says GE. He's going to get his medication in the clinic. If it's something you have to go down and only with him do, or it's delegated to someone that can only where he can be, and that would be a special education setting. Um, and therefore, that time is taken out whenever we start figuring out how many minutes a day does Johnny get for special ed services, that number of minutes are included. And that drives what's called his instructional arrangement code, which again is sent to PINGS. And all of those things contribute to dollars. So uh, certain instructional arrangement codes get funded at a certain level and others get funded at another level. So it's very important that all of the things be in there uh, correct. Uh, you need to fill out a SHARS uh, checklist and Ron's going to address that. So if there are um, health service minutes, uh, the Exceed program is supposed to prompt this, uh, the SHARS drop down to open up. It's supposed to be filled out, okay? If that doesn't happen, I don't know if it happens automatically before they leave the page. I don't know if it, I don't know if it prompts or opens up, but when you're facing your screen on your computer, on the left-hand side, there's a column, and toward the bottom of it, it talks about health services uh, personal care service checklist and the person who's running the computer can click on that and this checklist will come up and you can fill it out and then it'll be able to be have data tracked so let's say that later you want to find out how many kids had a form how many kids had the service of um, get up here where I can see that inhalation therapy well we could we'd be able to say you know a thousand kids had a form and only two or ten had inhalation therapy so it's really good for driving data because each one of those services have minutes, have time. You calculate that all together. It helps you gather data for staffing. This is filled out for every single student, whether they're Medicaid eligible or not. If the student is Medicaid,
Medicaid eligible, which is the job of the Medicaid office to figure out. They know who's eligible and who's not. Then this is what generates your SHARS billing. And then every six weeks, you know, you receive that um, billing ticket and you need to fill it out and return it to uh, Barbara Cross at, at Medicaid. So um, let's just take an example um, of a student. We can take a couple examples. Let's say you have a, a, a student who has spina bifida and they need to be catheterized, they need a clean intermittent catheterization three times a day, okay? So whether it's uh, the nurse is gonna do it or you're gonna train the TA to do it, it's a delegated procedure, that's still gonna be 20 minutes a day. So automatically on your schedule page, you're gonna start to add it up. Okay, well that's 20, uh, three casts a day, that's 60 minutes. And then in addition, she gets medication at lunch, um, and dip your pan or whatever for bladder tone, and uh, that's 15 minutes. Medication is med administration is 15 minutes. And she also gets uh, gastrostomy tube feedings, and she gets two of those a day, and that's a half hour. So you're adding those up. So it's a significant amount of minutes that you can do. We know that we are very appreciably under capturing and under reporting our uh, health service minutes in the R. It may be like a student with ADHD or maybe you have a student with seizures um, that you don't do something for them every day. Well, you can make that decision. I'm going to check in on them one hour a day or maybe I go down to the classroom every day and, uh, you know, for 10, 15 minutes. So that's so many, 75 hours a week for maybe a, a very severe student. Or they have a VP shunt and he has an emergency action plan and I'm just keeping tabs with that teacher and making sure he's doing okay, right? And so maybe it might be even just 30 minutes every six weeks that I'm going down there and checking in. So give yourself credit for the work that you do and make sure that you put it in your schedule of services page, okay? Can you explain here, and oftentimes we get questions like, oh, there's too many minutes, or he went over his total allotted minutes. Can you address that? A child who's coming to school every single day, five days a week, there's no need for a reduced day. He's figured at a 35-hour instructional week. So there's seven hours in a day. So what we should do is children should be made available to get courses at the same rate as their non-disabled peers. If a second grader gets two hours of language arts, this child needs to get two hours of language arts, even though he may only get 40 minutes of it, or 30 minutes is actually supported by special education. So the remainder of that time might be in a general education setting. So whenever you get through adding up your minutes, all of a sudden we've got 40 hours in a week and the child's only there 35, so that creates a problem. That's why it's very important we really look at that because you're, if you're needing to pull him out that many minutes or that many hours, that means some of the other areas are being reduced and they should be reflected accordingly at the top of the page. I'm not getting a full two hours or 75 minutes perhaps in English. If in order to come to school and, and participate in school, I must have these medical con, uh, services that are listed in the middle of the page. So that's where you get the time is over. And so the case manager and the ARD committee, as they develop this, they'll say, in order to implement this language arts goal, how many minutes of support do we need? That's what drives the minutes at the top. In order to perform his health care needs, how many minutes do we need? And that's what drives the minutes in the middle of the page. So your minutes should not be reduced just to make it balanced. Your minutes should be there what you really need. Okay, that's Charles. Okay. With um, uh, the least restrictive environment, often. Um, will help you when you're um, demonstrating to the uh, principal or the classroom staff that this should be a delegated procedure. Because what would happen is, if my kiddio that was spina bifida actually has 135 minutes a day of health services and has to go to the nurse's office for all those services. So your principal says, um, well, let's just take it from the beginning. What if your principal says, no, I'm sorry, we, we can't do that for that kid? Well, then you say, well, really, it's a violation of their civil rights because 
or into free and appropriate public education, we need to do those services. And um, we're able to do those services because they don't require a doctor. So there's your first argument. Then they say, well, it has to be done by a nurse. I'm not going to delegate it to the student. And so, well, he's also entitled to a right to, to be in the least restrictive environment. And if we can safely um, uh, teach that procedure and monitor it, then he should be able to receive his tube feeding in the cafeteria with the rest of his peers. Or he does just uh, takes half amount of time to have a private area in the classroom or a table in the bathroom where you can catheterize that student instead of you know, 10 minutes transport. That means the TA is not with the other students for that period of time, has to bring the student down to the nurse's office and so on. So you, it's not least restrictive environment to have the student in the nurse's office for 135 minutes a day. Okay. Um, the continuum of services, again, the setting is driven by the need, not the disability. And we have um, everything from the, you know, your FLS, your ADLS, and your like PPCD maximum support um, to the other classrooms, all the way to kids that are included in um, regular ed. And Karen's going to talk about what these different settings look like. Okay, a lot of times people say, well, he needs a PPCD. He's, he's getting PPCD services. Well, really, he's not. PPCD is just the setting. And so he's getting whatever services he needs, and children who are three through the age of six can go to a PPCD. If I'm six on September 1st, I can't receive services in that setting. I would need to receive my services either in the general ed class or somewhere else, but that's the preschool child uh, development uh, center that we used to call it, our preschool program for children with disabilities. And we have several different kinds in Dallas. We have a collaborative where they're out within the regular class a lot. Maximum structure, those are children who need a lot of structure in their day. Uh, so typically, you would see children with autism or emotional or behavioral needs, and that can be brought about by a TBI, traumatic brain injury, or a number of other things, seizure disorder. Then you have children who need uh, maximum support to medical needs. And so uh, it might not be safe for them to be in a classroom with other children that are running around. And so we have to balance the need for inclusion in a least restrictive environment based on also the health condition. So again, the disability doesn't drive it. If he needs services that can only be delivered in this location based on his needs, the law allows us to consolidate some of those services because it's not financially feasible to provide that level of care at every single campus. The um, activities of daily living, you'll hear about the ADL classroom. Those are usually more impaired children. They're working on exactly that, activities of daily living. Functional living skills, those children are working on functional living skills. Um, and they're building up those prerequisite skills to some type of basic academics. And then your autism program supports total communication. In the past, we've heard the classrooms referred to as total communication classrooms. Uh, it isn't just autism children or children with autism that can be in those settings, but it, a lot of times it is, and those teachers have special training to work with those uh, children. And then we have behavior programs, and they're highly structured all the way, a continuum of services from their mainstream, and there's somebody there to help them in case they start having a meltdown, teaching social skills, all the way up to almost a they spend most of their time in the behavior classroom as they gain the skills and the behavioral controls in order to go out into the regular classroom. Um, on the continuum of services, a lot of times you'll hear people shortcut, shorthand speak again. I have a child we need to do an ARD next week and he's a PPCD kid, as if they've already determined where this child is going. <laughs> and you'll hear, oh, he's going to be an ADL kid, or we need to put him in the TC unit. We uh, on my side of the fence, understand what we're saying. We're really not saying we've predetermined. We're saying that based on the evaluation data that I've looked at and my experience with working with a large group of children, most of the time the needs that I've developed in this FIE suggest that this would be the kind of services, the level of services he might need, and that's what I'm going to recommend to the art committee. But we need to stay away from predetermination. That's a a really serious thing. Our committees make decisions for eligibility for services. Our committees make decisions on 
what location, site location, our committee makes decisions on the set. So we make recommendations. We talk among ourselves in our own little language, but when we get in front of a parent or we get in front of an art committee, we need to be careful about the language we use. And we need to talk about, you know, little Johnny, he's quite active, he's four years old, and he's gonna need more intensive supervision in a highly language-rich environment. He also needs some exposure to uh, normally developing peers. Therefore, I'm suggesting that perhaps we need a little bit more intensive structure part of the day, and he could be with other four-year-olds in the pre-K class the rest of the day. When I'm talking to my peer, or I'm talking to you, I might say, we've got a little PPCD art that's coming up next week. But I'm, I'm really not predetermining, that's just my perception. So that's just a, that, that goes back to the disability. A lot of times you'll hear people say, well, that's where our AI kids go. Well, that's where the children who have auditory impairment to need that level of service would most likely receive their services. But just because I have an auditory impairment or just because I have a vision impairment doesn't mean I must go there if my needs can be met somewhere else. And I think that's very important. Another thing that came to mind as Robin was talking is that if you get into the situation and you're going to go to R and you're not comfortable with what's happening and it's a pretty involved child or maybe it's not involved, you're just not comfortable for some reason, the best thing we can do is stop and have a planning session before we go to the art table. Arts are school district meetings that we are required to invite parents and we want parent participation, but we are one team. It's the school district team and it's the parent team and we're both there for the same reason and that's to plan the best program we can for that child. And if everybody who's at the table uh, or if somebody at the table or many people at the table sometimes don't really understand that foundation, the evaluation, or they don't really understand why we're looking at different alternatives, sometimes it's like we get on opposite sides of the fence while we're at the table and that's not the place to do it. So uh, speak up, be an advocate for yourself or your ch or the child, and say, you know, I'd feel more, I'd really feel more comfortable before we go to ARD next week if we could sit down and talk about this a little bit. Maybe, maybe I need a better understanding, or maybe you're the one with the understanding, and you feel like they need a better understanding, and that's going to be your opportunity to share. So uh, by all means, ask. Don't feel like you can't ask. Don't feel like you um, are stepping on somebody's toes because you question. We welcome questions, and we um, it is a multidisciplinary team of which you're a very, very valued member. So, um, by all means, exercise that right. One of the most important places that the nurse contributes to uh, the our document, and this is required, is in the committee minutes. So the meeting is basically wrapping up. You've already talked about what it is. You've already, uh, what kind of services, what kind of setting. Um, and then the very last part, you have the assurances, and then you have committee minutes. If we're gonna give health services as a related service, they need to be described in the committee minutes. So here's where you need to put on your, your editing thinking cap and very succinctly in one sentence if possible, two at the most, describe the general health services that you're going to give the student, okay? I'm gonna monitor the student in the classroom for uh, side effects or effectiveness of um, uh, medication regime for ADHD, okay? Something like that. You could say, if you have a lot of delegated services, student will receive medications and procedures according to current medical orders and individual health care plan developed by the school nurse. And in your health care plan, you've already set out, well, I'm going to delegate these procedures, I'm going to use my skills checklist, I'm going to monitor it, student will receive their catheterizations with low risk of infection and be able to participate in their plan. So again, that's why your IHP is important, because you can go on and be as detailed as you want in that. Um, but in the committee minutes, you're basically going to say very succinctly what the student needs, okay? Um, and that's not easy, that's not always easy to do. Um, this is uh, the page, the last page. 
and this committee minutes, and this is an expandable field that's highlighted. So everyone's going to say, students going to receive um, whatever their piece is. Um, student will receive uh, um, his education in a regular, pleasure, uh, regular um, classroom, so many minutes, and so that kind of thing. So this is where you need to say what it is. You can collaborate with your, um, with your uh, case manager or your diagnostician beforehand to work out that language. Again, we can't predetermine, and this is a field that um, can be changed when you're at the R committee. Okay? So if your piece is not there ahead of time, that's fine. Just say, hang on just a second, I need to add something. Can you please type this in? We oftentimes get letters from doctors or prescriptions and they say student needs special education services. Can a doctor write a prescription for special education services? Hmm? What are you going to do when you have a letter from the doctor that says student needs special ed? You're going to go to SST and it's going to be part of the information that you've collected and that you've interpreted for your, um, the R committee. So no, doctors cannot write prescriptions for special ed. They can make recommendations, but they cannot prescribe. Okay. We had last year a case um, in a, a high school to be unnamed where we had um, a chiropractor writing um, prescription for a student to get um, special ed services. Um, so again, just to review, um, you're going to be involved in the initial reviews and the three-year re-evaluations as part of the full and individual evaluation. Then the annual review, anything that needs to be changed, a copy of the IHP or the ECP can be attached. Um, you uh, may uh, contribute vision and hearing. And by the way, vision and hearing, thanks to a health office, is now automatically interfaced into the Exceed program through, um, they, they connect. So if uh, someone comes to you, the case manager, to say, I need you to fill out this vision and hearing form, that's no longer necessary. If you don't do it, please don't do it because it's a practice, um, it's, it's just not necessary, it's a double step because that information is in the Exceed program. Sit down with your partner, with your um, case managers, and um, look at what's in there. There's a lot of health information along with the grades and everything um, else that's tracked for the student in Exceed. The teachers can see uh, how many times they've visited the health office, whether the student has an IHP, and those kind of things. So that's very helpful. Um, when they open it up and they see that they have an IHP, we hope that they know that that's a trigger that they need to involve you. It's got to be a two-way street, though, and please go down to your special education classrooms and know those students and, and uh, be part of that team and, and coordinate with those people um, uh, so that um, we're going to try to prevent in the future this whole thing of uh, the arts already started and, oh, yeah, gee, we need a nurse and you come in and you're not familiar with the student and you didn't have an opportunity to prepare. So there's responsibilities. Uh, you know, on all sides for not for them to communicate to you the students that you need to be involved in, and then you also need to communicate to them the students that they need to involve you in, right? Because it's a team. My bottom line the, uh, barometer that I always tell people to use is that if you don't need no, if you need a nurse, then you need a nurse, right? Because it's a nursing decision, it's nursing judgment about whether or not you should be there and um, what the student's needs are and what health services uh, the student should receive. Okay? If there are health services provided, then you should be in the R. Okay? That's your responsibility. Um, Karen already talked about this, about uh, predetermination. She already talked about uh, due process and the parents' rights. There is this thing called the sacred red folder, which is usually in this sacred file drawer of a tomb somewhere, and someone has the magical key that unlocks the mysteries to the red folder, okay? You do not need permission to look at the red folder. You're a member of the team, okay? Please go and see and look at the 
red folders. Those are the our documents. A wealth of information is in there. Um, if you're getting a student that transfers in in third grade and they've been in there since PBCD, you can see uh, you know reports from doctors, medical reports, therapy, um, the old IHPs. Maybe they're coming from a different district. They got health services. That information is going to be in there. Okay, uh, it's very important. Look at those folders. Be familiar with how they're set up. They're set up in the same sequence and organized just like your art committee is, okay, in all those different um, folders. If you have pertinent um, test results or evaluation, so let's say you referred this ch uh, student with cognitive disabilities, they were a, a syndromic looking child, eventually they got into genetic, um, you know, the genetics. Uh, clinic over at Children's, and you have a report from them that says the student has, you know, a, a, a chromosomal deletion of some type. Put that in the, in the uh, other document section of the R, because some down the line it's going to be valuable information for you. Immunizations and things like that, they don't go in the R, but, you know, relevant health information that might impact the student's educational plan, that should go in the red folder. So please, Make sure um, that you are familiar with that and you know who has the magical um, key. When you open the red folder, there's an access log. Please take credit for the fact that you looked in that uh, and reviewed the R in there and sign your name. Okay. Some um, resources that uh, parents receive are very helpful for you. Um, also, these can be um, accessed either directly through TEA. They're also accessed through the Special Education Department um, website as a guide to the admission review and dismissal process. Uh, it's basically uh, everything that a parent needs to know, you should probably know too, right? So, um, and then we really can't go wrong if, if we're all on the page as far as, same page as far as rights and responsibilities. Um, the notice of procedural safeguards is also a parent um, document. And this, this has helpful information also um, about sometimes there's confusion about the timelines, the clock is ticking, how much time do we have, you know, those kind of, that kind of information you can find in these two documents. Um, and anything else you want to say about the, the art process or the nurse? I'll go back. Okay. Okay, I want to go back and visit just a second back here about the vision and hearing. Exceed does provide us access to things we didn't have before. I don't have a full, I don't have a, um, that's right here. We, we can see the vision and hearing, but if vision and hearing hasn't been done in the last 12 months, then we'll still need to get that done. So there's some tools available to help you. And a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago now, we developed some training and trained some of the supervising nurses about how to identify which kids at your campus real quickly are special education. There is a report, and if you don't have access to it in Exceed, or, or if you need access to it, we can make arrangements for you to get it. But one of them is an ARD FIE roster. It's a report that lists all the children that are being managed, not necessarily attending, but managed by that school, and their name and their ID number, and the next time their FIE is due, and when their last next art is due. And so that might be one helpful roster. The second tool that might be helpful is there's a report called an evaluation projection report. We use it to pull up all the kids that are due between two designated time frames. Right now I'm going to be looking for all children that are doing evaluation through September 30th of 2013. So if you were wanting to see who at my campus is coming up for evaluation, in the next three months, you could say to your diagnostician, could you run that report for me? Could you share? And if you have the ability to do it, you could sign in to exceed and do it for yourself. And that way you could go in and spot check. Do I have a vision and hearing in here? And if I don't, you can get it done. When I was a diagnostician, I used to try to give my nurse things in the spring that were due in the fall. And I'd give things in the fall that were going to be due the next spring so that we weren't on this magic uh, rush, rush, except for the kids who transferred in from somewhere else. But that is something that uh, we can get the vision and hearing from Exceed, and we can use it from Exceed, provided it's within the last 12 months. Um, 
If we need a health history though, whatever the reason is, it's an initial referral and we need a health history, then there still may need to be a form. But if it's an initial referral, that really should have come through the SST as the nurse contributor on that SST team. What would be good is to have attempted to either work with a general ed teacher and find out what that health history was. The first time you bring mom up for a meeting and say, you know, Johnny's not really progressing and we're gonna start some new interventions and here's some things we're gonna collect on him. That might be a good time to say, do you mind if I get some more information? Is there, could there be any health related issues that's interfering? Gather that data then. And one another reason is because it's real difficult to say that that general ed teacher has chosen the right interventions she doesn't know that he fell out of bed at two years old and has a, had a head injury. She doesn't know he had high fever at four years old. She doesn't know that he, whatever he's done, that didn't leave necessarily any visible signs, but they're strong indicators that that child's going to have difficulty learning, either at the same rate or the same level, and may need additional supports. So that very first intervention time would be a real good time to get that health history. And so that's all, that's what I wanted to say about the vision and hearing and the, uh, what's available and exceed. Okay, I just want to uh, talk about the special needs school nurses and um, uh, they've been in orientation with me this week and um, are going to be learning their jobs as, uh, alongside you as, as you learn what they do. Um, the special needs school nurses are, like Suzanne said, not there to replace your, your job. Please don't feel like they're um, interloping on your territory if they come and visit your campus or help you with, you know, students. Um, please, uh, um, you know, know that they're not there to evaluate you and your performance. Their, their role is just to improve the services for the students. And, make sure that the um, health services that we are providing, we're taking credit for in our, they're gonna have um, a certain caseload. And most of the students that they're gonna be involved with are gonna be like low incidence and not that common issues. So, um, you know, not just your non-compliant asthmatic that you're having a hard time with, it's more like the kids with um, special procedures or unusual um, diagnosis or, or conditions. Um, so um, uh, we will develop, you know, a certain expertise because they will be going to a lot of ARDS and have, you know, specialized training with special education on that. So you can uh, certainly ask them um, questions and call them. Um, but it's not their job to go to um, your ARDS that you can't attend. Very important that if you don't have a full-time assignment, that you communicate your schedule with your SST and your R committee and that they meet um, on the days that you're there. Um, so they're there to support the students and families um, and you as school nurses and the teaching staff to meet those health and safety needs and reduce those health barriers to learning. So that's my broken record about that. Um, the chain of responsibility for these kids, you as the campus nurse, you still own all the students on your campus. So you're still responsible for their daily, you know, general health and safety needs, okay? Always notify your supervisor or communicate with your supervisor first, okay? That is always and invariably your first chain of command when you need um, help with a, a student, any student. For specialized student and students with complex medical needs, then they will communicate with a special needs school nurse, and then they'll start to work with you. Once you start working with them, then you don't need to call the supervisor first, but you all need to be in the loop um, for those special issue kids. Um, one of the things that we're most excited about with the special needs school nurses is that we are gonna be interfacing with child client. So I'm sure many of you have had this experience where all of a sudden off pops off the bus pops a kid and he's got you know a tube or he's got a trach or he's got an umbilical urostomy and you're like hey <laughs> surprise child find teams used to have nurses interfacing with them for whatever reason historically that service and that that interfacing um, it kind of has been minimized over the last few years 
because all the nurses, honestly, were campus based and we didn't have extra personnel. Now we have the nurses, uh, special needs nurses, who are going to be part of the child find evaluations from the get go with students with complex medical needs. Our goal is to have a lot of the initial work for the ARD because these placement ARDs happen before you even know that the student's enrolled on the campus, right? You find out how this, we've got a new student, they're coming. The ARDs already happened. So our special needs school nurses are going to be doing the health history and status with the family for children who may qualify through special ed through child find. They're going to be helping to develop the IHP. So let's say we got a little three-year-old kitty who is coming in with Paget's disease. They're going to need a lot of specialized services. There's a lot of specialized information that needs to be passed along about those children um, and then the care that they require. Your special needs school nurse who's interfaced with that child fund team is going to help to prepare that IHP so that's going to be ready. Okay? We're going to attend the arts. Um, and we're going to put in the health service minutes, okay? So we're going to try to do all that stuff beforehand, okay? Um, just like if you would consider that child find team kind of an SST committee, that preliminary work that each child needs, those school nurses are, uh, the special needs nurses are going to do. So we're hoping that this prevents a lot of problems where we have kids on the first day of school or their first day of enrollment who are showing up and we have to send them home because we don't have doctor's orders or um, you know, a plan for them or trained delegated staff and that kind of stuff. So I'm really, really, really excited about that. Um, I think that'll be great. For uh, special uh, procedures and skills, uh, let's face it, we, no matter uh, what background we come from and very, very, um, very varied and interesting backgrounds we all come through, we all haven't taken care of every single thing um, that uh, is out there. Or you may have taken care of it and it was, you know, when you were a caveman nurse like me, you know, it's 30 years ago and they do things very different now. So for those very unusual things or something that you haven't dealt with, the special needs nurses will be there to help support with that procedure training and making sure everyone's comfortable with the care of the child. And then of course, um, like I said, assisting with the art processes. So we really want to say, uh, thank Suzanne for her vision and her leadership, um, pulling out of um, some magic hats. <laughs> we don't know how she does it. You know, the funding for new um, positions in an environment where budgets are so tight, and, and we just thank her very much for that. Um, so I think we're going to uh, answer some questions. I'm sure you guys have questions. Um, uh, so fire away. Anybody have a question? Yes. So when will we be notified that the Well, you you should be notified when the placement is made. So oftentimes, it, particularly like Karen said, with the settings, a child may live at this certain address, but their their home school doesn't have a PPCD maximum support classroom, so they might have to be um, transported to you know another classroom, uh, you know, closer to you. So as soon as we know where they're going to go, we're going to make every effort to, um, to uh, make sure that you know that. The special needs nurses are also going to document in health office, just like you all document in health office. So the health history should be in your health office. The IHP should be there. They're going to document when they went to the ARDS, just like you do. They're going to document you know, when they received doctor's orders, just like you do. So they will be you know, documenting like all good nurses. If you don't document, you don't do it. They're going to do a lot of work and they're going to document it in the health office. Okay. Even if it's your kid and they come out and they do something for your kid, it's still going to be documented. Okay. Yes. I'm not sure what your role, what all um, actions you have in your role. There's a nurse's role, and so that's read only. But if it's not built in there, then I'm going to talk to SDMS about getting it in there if you think that's something you need and would use. If, uh, if for some reason it won't work together, then your diagnostician, your campus person can always get it. 
or there's you know there's other ways of getting of getting it. We'll, we'll look at that. If there's something you guys want or Suzanne wants you to have, then I'll talk to Deborah Hill. I'm gonna I can talk to that a little bit more. The the nursing supervisors and their special needs nurses now have read access only to exceed the nurses. We don't intend for us to ever have data entry into that system. It's very complicated. It takes a lot of training. It's very time consuming. One of the reasons that we don't have read-only, that the nurses on the campuses don't have read-only is because we really want you to collaborate with your teachers, and we really want you to go down there and, and work with them. What has happened, I guess, I understand with Encore is that there had been training and nurses had read access, but it is a complicated system, and if you only use it every once in a while, it was really kind of uh, more trouble than it was worth oftentimes because when you get in there, you get lost. So um, uh, so right now, nurses, uh, campus nurses will not have read access only, but you have, you will collaborate with your supervisors, your caseworkers, your, your evaluators, and your special needs nurses, and, and they can help you with that, okay? And bottom line is go and find the magic key and look at that red folder, yeah. Question. For Shars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe Shars allows 15 minutes for medication administration time. So if you're giving three meds, it's 15 minutes. If you're giving one medicine twice a day, it's 30 minutes. So I maybe that's my understanding. I'm not I'm often corrected. PRN medications are difficult to put in charge but if it's an everyday medication and that, that's a related service and your student has an IEP, then you can take credit for that. Mm -hmm. Roscoe, you know, Roscoe always gets his little, Roscoe Lewis gets his presentation every year, so that's a question we can ask him. But no, you can, you can do that. Yes? When you hit, the question is that there's some confusion between the schedule page and the schedule minutes for health services and the SHARS drop down. If you have services that are scheduled in terms of minutes on the service page, so let's say I have a G tube feeding, it's twice a day, it takes me a half hour, that's going to be 60 minutes a day. Your next step is to say at the R. Wait a minute. We have to fill up the. We fit, need to fill out that SHARS checklist sheet. Go down there and open it up in your personal. Open it up, and you'll. It'll say gastrostomy tube feeding, direct or indirect, whatever it says, and you fill that out. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let Roscoe yeah, talk to that because that, that may have changed. So. What other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, the special procedures, um, if you need a special procedures training like right away, um, that you have a kid showing up before the scheduled ones, please call your supervisor and either they or your, the special needs school nurse for your division can come out and help with that. Remember that parents should always demonstrate procedures, you know, at the beginning of the year, so that's a double check, so that you know that they're doing it correctly and they can be comfortable that you're doing it correctly. But there will be gastrostomy tube training through Scottish Rite and trait training through um, uh, Children's uh, Hospital. Again, this fall, the dates will be announced um, through the bulletin, I imagine, or through an email. Okay. So that about, we'll take one more question and then we'll get a quick break and Suzanne's going to talk. Tina, I can't hear you. Can you stand up, please? Yeah. 
Yes. If there's a major change in the services, then they can have like a, a, a can you answer that? I'm going to let Karen answer a second. Okay. Uh, in case I forget, I've really got two points. And one point is what she's talking about. You have a child who is uh, who's getting 30 minutes a day. Something happens and he routinely gets 45 minutes a day or an hour a day. What you need to do is go back to ARD and tell the ARD committee the services he now needs. And they either do a revision to the last ARD. It used to be called a brief ARD. It's now called a revision ARD. And they revise it. Or you, if it's time, you'll do a new full annual. But you do, if you are substantially exceeding the minutes that are in your current ARD, you should go to ARD and get the minutes you're actually serving that child into the ARD so that you can bill and we can get reimbursed uh, for those minutes. And the second thing that, I'm getting old so I often forget, but the second point I wanted to talk about was if you have somebody show up and the kid's being served, excuse me, the student is being served, as a child with, uh, let's say, a, uh, orthopedic impairment. And so he's already getting some kind of services from you. But now they bring you documentation and he's having a substantial seizure disorder, or he has been identified as having a syndrome. That needs to go to your diagnostician. Yes, we're gonna file some records in the red folder, but if there's another possibility, that there's another disabling condition, or something else that would affect his services, we may need to do another evaluation because evaluation should encompass all areas of suspected disability and suspected needs. So, um, if and you're likely on a medical condition, you're going to be the first, you know, the first one who's told about it. And so, if he's general ed, needs to go to your diagnostician and your SST committee. If he's special ed, if something else comes up, goes to your diagnostician, and they need to look at it. We probably need to go to ARD. If the child's general ed and anybody says to you, I want my baby to have special ed, he's taking medicine at home, we have a legal obligation to be responsive. And the attorneys usually interpret that to be something like within 10 school days. And so we set up a meeting, we go to SST, we talk about whether or not there's a need, and if there's not a need for special ed, there's a form, there's a document that we're required to give them. It's called a prior written notice, even though we're giving them, it comes after the discussion, but it, all it does is notify them that the school district, in collaboration with them, have decided that, that at this time we're not going to be doing any testing or evaluation. So there's a procedure. So anytime you hear the word special ed and the child is um, general ed, that needs to be brought to your diagnostician or your psychologist's attention and your SST person because I think we're missing, uh, we're handling that real informally and uh, we really need to be alert to it. And so you're the gatekeeper on many, many of those issues.